Uh, my name is Patrick Gomez. I am a senior writer at People Magazine, uh, and I really appreciate you guys coming out here today and uh, being here for this Louder Milk screening and panel. Uh, and I want to get as many questions in as we can. So, uh, without further ado, let me introduce the uh, cast and crew and creators of Louder Milk. We have Peter Farrelly, Bobby Mort, Ron Livingston, Laura Minnell, Will Sasso, and Andres Sasevich. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. Uh, I think we have some fans of the show now after that screening. Uh, I'll start off with the first question being for the men that are uh, responsible for this whole baby even being started. And what's it like to craft something? How long ago was the inception of this idea? And what's it like now that people are actually seeing it? Well, Bob, Bobby Mort started it, so I'm going to hand this over to him. It so, yeah, it was uh, going backwards. It's very exciting that everyone can see this finally because it feels like it's been sort of gestating for such a long time. But it has been three and a half years from starting Fade In to premiere tonight. So basically that's it. So we had the script on spec and then Pete got a hold of it and we developed the series and the characters and just built the season out like that. So it's been a really, I mean, relatively speaking, I think pretty quick process so and, and very exciting and so how did you how did you come into this whole thing and how did you feel like you were able to put a stamp on it as well coming into a project that well tonally i i loved what he had done my sister sent me the script one day and i wasn't looking for anything but she just said hey i think you're gonna like this script so i read it and i remember thinking on page three i really really like this character this would be fun and uh, i was smitten right away i could see the possibilities and and so just, you know, called him and said, hey, let me, you know, let me help out. I, I, I get this guy. I love music. I love this world. You only saw the pilot, but he's a, a music uh, uh, critic, a uh, former music critic who's gone off the you know, rails and is taking time away from it. But music plays a big part in this show. And there was just a lot I liked about it. Uh, but by the way, three and a half uh, years, he says it wasn't that long. But, you know, in like 1962, I think uh, JFK said, let's try to get to the moon before the end of the decade. And they did, you know. <laughs> So it, it seemed long to me. <laughs> um, and uh, for all of the actors involved, I'd love to kind of go down the line and kind of hear how you became a part of this project. This actually was a question that came from here. They all wanted to know the story of how did you hear about it, how many auditions, that kind of thing, the process to get to where you are. Uh, I had a couple of different people tell me about it. Like, there's this script out there that, I, you know, you would probably be great for. Um, and there, it's people you know, that I know in different capacities. So I was like, wow, okay. If, the, if these two people agree on anything, I should, you know, I should call my guys up and see and, and uh, what's going on. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we're on it. We're on it. We're just waiting, you know. And uh, so, yeah, and I got, on the, I got on the phone with Pete and it was, uh, it was pretty clear. It, I mean, as you can see, it's not something that's, uh, there's not like a playbook that this is something that oh I know that that is that's just like that other show that's like that it's not so there you know I had a bunch of questions about like what is it what <laughs> you know where's it go what's the tone uh, and I was really excited by all the by all the answers um, so yeah it was nice I was really uh, I was honored to be a part of it and we'll go down the line um, I had heard about it actually from a, an actor mentor friend of mine. I was going to tape an audition for something that I don't even remember what the heck it was now. Um, and she, at the end of the taping, was like, have you read for this thing called Louder Milk? It's just come out, it's amazing. And she showed me a couple scenes for uh, the Allison character. And I loved it. I mean, the, the writing is just fantastic and it just seemed real and fun and it seemed like a great opportunity and then I, tape for that and then saw Pete and then taped another couple of times and here we are. So it was, it was great. It was great. Um, I heard about it through my manager and I sent a tape way off into the internet and thought it would get lost and <laughs> as we always think with tapes and um, I heard back and Peter was in town doing a callback so I got to go to that and it was brief 
but after that I heard that there would be a testing so I was waiting around waiting around and then I wasn't hearing anything so I thought oh, okay well this isn't going my way you know I'm not even gonna ask because when I ask it's always oh you know you're not in the mix anymore um, so <laughs> uh, but lo and behold it did and I remember talking to Bobby and he said yeah we were just going through tapes and we were like hey what about that girl and I guess I ended up being that girl so that's pretty cool <laughs> Um, I, I was fortunate enough to have worked with Pete before, and then uh, <clears throat> we were, we were, I was outside uh, CBS at Radford, now, uh, over there, and uh, Pete almost ran over me in his car. <laughs> it's true. And uh, he said, oh, I'm glad I ran into you, <laughs> but no. And then, uh, no, but he said, and then we talked for a little while, and we exchanged insurance information, and uh, then, and he told me, there's a, there's a thing I want you to read, and then, yeah, like a year, almost a year later, he called me up and said, remember that thing? Yeah, you want to do it? And then, uh, yeah, I read it and I loved it. And so, yeah, and I'm almost, my femur is almost in one, I walk a little different. I'm actually an inch taller on my left side now because of Pete running into me. I'm sure that impacted the uh, pay negotiations too. <laughs> um, how much did, because I, mean, I don't know how much we see in the pilot in terms of how much effect, but obviously the actors for something that's, that's going on for episodes, they begin to impact the characters. For you guys, how have you seen the characters change from what you originally thought because of the actors playing them? I would say they didn't really change at all, only in that it's, it's really the first show I worked on where the scripts were all done for the most part when we started. Like we knew, uh, you know, we got a great big binder with all of the scripts because we shot them all, uh, we block shot it, which means we shot them all at the same time. Uh, not, so not in order. Yeah, not in order. Uh, you know, we'd be doing on any given day, we'd do a scene from episode one and a scene from episode, like if it was in a coffee shop, we were shooting it today. You know what I mean? Yeah. When we went to the, you know, to the apartment, we were in the apartment. Uh, and it's, it's kind of great. It's like doing a, a, a big long movie where you know the, the beginning, middle and end. And what it, just for you guys, what is the benefit of, of getting able to craft all of that versus, you know, other shows obviously work a little bit more week to week and... Uh, you, you mean, what, what is the benefit of, of block shooting it? Mm -hmm. Well, honestly, it's really just money. Uh, that's the truth. Like, if you shoot one episode at a time, it's going to take you a lot longer because you have to keep going back to that kitchen. And, but that's how we shoot movies. You know, you never shoot a movie in order. You'll shoot, you know, the, you'll do all the dining room scenes one day, all the bedroom scenes another day. So it, it's, it's an advantage like that. But uh, the great thing I liked about this show was that, and, the, and about the pilot, is we didn't give that way much away in the pilot. Like, that's what I don't like about a lot of pilots, where you have to establish everything. What does he do? What does she do? Where do they live? Where is he from? What's, did he get married? Is he divorced? You know, all those things we... You know, we just want to do a little bit, and then in episode two, a little more, and it's a gradual chipping away and learning who these guys are, these people are, over the entire year that I found the most satisfying, almost like a novel. You know, you wouldn't read a novel in the first chapter, know everything about them, but you find things out as you go along, and uh, that's what I liked about it. I just have this picture of, like, you know, you take all the exposition that there could possibly be and ball it up and then, like, stuff it. So the audience is like an anaconda with this big, <laughs> you know. And then the idea is, like, okay, so we got that out of the way in the pilot, and now we can start the show. We, yeah. didn't, we didn't do that. Um, and obviously, uh, the audience is, is a they, I mean, they're in grade, you know that you're going to get an audience because it is tied to a, a cable network, but it's, it's a relatively newer um, network. Does that matter at the point anymore? I mean, we have, we have streaming networks, we have uh, cable, we have pay cable, we have basic cable, we have network. That's basically never even occurred to me, honestly. I didn't care because they, they, we went in and they said, do 10 episodes, go. And I was like, awesome you know they were there was no uh i didn't think about that you know when when breaking bad came out on amc nobody was watching amc for tv but it, they let them do what they do best so it became a great show and that was my feeling but, you know and absolutely and, yeah. it, it, it was like it, it was a platform as good as any platform it's like we get the opportunity to tell this big long story and it's like that's fantastic i mean everyone wins i think uh for the actors on the panel what do you guys 
you know, you mentioned a couple pages in that you knew this was a project you wanted to work on. What were the elements of the characters that you ended up getting cast as that you found most appealing and the easiest to dive into and, and juiciest parts? Uh, I can say for me what I, uh, that I immediately liked Ben. Like, I liked him. I thought he was a good pal to Sam. And what I really uh, grew to like is, is how he's not a good pal uh, to Sam. <clears throat> and, and not a good pal to himself and kind of a, you know, just a fuck up. Uh, and I really thought that was very, very well done. I really, really enjoyed, uh, you know, a character that you would normally see like, oh, he's the friend, he's going to you know, be affable and stuff. But there, there was so much that I was really excited about playing because he's, a, you know, he, he's messed up and bounces off of Loudermilk like the rest of these characters who all have uh, some sort of problem as, as Loudermilk's trying to, you know, uh, fix everybody for lack of a better Term. I, I really liked how Ben was uh, <laughs> d damaged, and you don't quite know. I mean, you still don't know really why. I just, you know, I sort of have my theories. Uh, that that was really fun to read and, and perform. I agree. I think Claire as well is damaged in her own ways, as you saw in this episode, in the pilot. Um, but there's so much heart in the show, and I, the way she develops is really cool, and the way they've written her, and she's really three dimensional and. I really like her relationship with Ron and Will in the show. They, they have a really good vibe and they jive off each other really well and they piss each other off a lot, but <laughs> they also get along, like they become friends. And I thought that was really cool because she was, she's so much younger. She has these different experiences, but at the same time, very similar experiences. It was such a weird crew to have <laughs> your character, like Claire and these two <laughs> shitty uncles. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was it, the original <laughs> title. <laughs> and how about for you? Um, I, I guess for me, I mean, first of all, I've just been playing so many kind of different roles, like, you know, the lawyer or like the, the sadistic vampire or, you know, like... Um, uh, lately, like, I'm a gossip columnist for the Nazi Reich party on The Man in the High Castle, so, uh, which is an amazing show, um, and I've loved working on lots of different things. We're talking about Loudermilk. I know, that's why I'm getting to it. <laughs> that's what I'm getting to, and I love, what I was about to say was this show is such a great show, you nerd, and, um, and it's so real and honest, and it has so much humor, but it's dark, it's very real and true to life and uh, I enjoyed Allison because in some ways I could just sort of be more intuitive and I wasn't going way out there with you know the vampires or the, the crazy stuff it, it was just real and honest and and um, yeah it's it's been a fun show so I really enjoyed that I could wake up in the morning and come to work without showering or combing my hair <laughs> <laughs> you know, and just let the chips fall where they may, and and uh, I don't know. It was a really attractive idea that, that this guy just had the freedom to say anything that uh, came to his mind without a filter, and uh, that's that's really fun. Um, I know w w I heard you talking a little bit uh, backstage about um, the music and how and how you you were put a, had a hand in that as well. Talk to us about how important music is to to a show not just this show but any show and, and why that's something that fascinates you of being having a hand in that I, I i love music and and in fact playing the music in a movie is my favorite part of making a movie once you've written it you've shot it you've done all the stuff and then you have the pleasure of like trying songs over scenes and see it pop it, it's just the greatest feeling in the world so I'm constantly listening to music. I have a guy named Tom Wolf, who's my music supervisor, and he's always sending me, check this out, check that out, check this out. So, uh, you know, I, that was what appealed to me about this character, is that this is a guy who loves music, and it was an opportunity for me for, and, and us for, to say, like, this song's great, that sucks. I don't like this song, I love this song. No one's heard of this, you gotta check this out. And we got a lot of new bands in there, because they're new bands, and we could get them cheap. We didn't have a huge budget. But I remember at one point, well, this wasn't a new band, but like the uh, opening credits, it's uh, Franz Ferdinand. And my music supervisor came back and said, they want 20 grand an episode for that. And I was like, we don't have that. That's 200 grand, 10 episodes. I, I said, tell him, you know, come on, that song's seven years old. No one's playing that song. Go back to him. <laughs> so he came back the next day and he says, uh, two grand an episode. I was awesome. <laughs> 
spectacular. <laughs> By the way, I want them to get every penny they can, but I don't have the money, honestly. Like it would, I, I want everybody to get all the money they can. But also, we're giving other bands like you know, Drug Dealer and and uh, uh, just you know, a lot of uh, the Lemon Twigs and uh, Foxygen, new bands giving them exposure and uh it was just fun part of it for me it, it really the m music is half the fun for me in the show yeah um so we have a question and it's it's very specifically worded so i want to i want to read it uh it's from james donnelly uh right here uh it says from uh and it's for you peter <laughs> from one south shore guy to another can you give any advice into success on what you did for this crazy business we love and i'd like to extend that not just from you guys but in terms of advice or I'd love to hear best advice and worst advice you've gotten because I think you get a lot of both when you're working in this industry and it's helpful to hear both sides. So you guys think about that while he answers his specific question. Well, I, I'm, I, are, you, are you an actor or a writer? I'm an actor. Okay. I always give this advice with the actors is do the, the Owen Wilson, Wes Anderson thing. And what they did is they just went and shot, you know, they shot, their first movie was a bottle rocket. But the first thing they did was shoot a little mini bottle rocket. They did like a 15 minute version of bottle rocket, this quirky little thing. And they, they played it in film festivals. You know, they paid for it themselves. They did it for a couple grand, few grand, whatever it was. They managed to do it. It got some attention in film festivals and James L. Brooks saw it and said, hey, there's a movie in that thing. And they said, great, we'll develop it into a movie. And he took him in, got him set up, and you know, they went and they wrote the thing. Movie bomb, by the way, it was a disaster. Uh, but- um, uh, I loved it. It, it, was a, it was a horrible disaster, but it's a great movie. And it came out and then it was on video and DVD and people were like calling me like, have you seen Bottle Rock? You gotta watch this movie. I mean, it was, you know, the first time you saw Owen and Luke and, and the way it was shot, it was that Wes Anderson quirkiness and just an amazing thing. So basically they took the bull by the horns and said, okay, I'm gonna do this. And they didn't wait around. It was, that's the, that's the easy, I know it sounds like, well, you know, you got it, but, and today, you know, you get these little cameras, you know, a few grand and you get, everybody wants to, you know, help out. Like, that's what I say to them. For the writers, this is what I always say. It is, and this is the best advice I ever got from my agent. It took me, every script I've ever written has taken me years to get made. It's just unbelievable. Like you expect, you got a hit movie, the next one will be a breeze. Nope, it's not, it's always hard. But I remember on Dumb and Dumber, that was passed on for four years, exact same script. Everybody in town passed on it. And we would go to actors and they would all pass. And we were going to them saying, hey, we're trying to get this movie made, what do you think? You wanna get on board? Well, my agent said one day, he says, from now on, don't say, do you wanna, you know, we're trying to get it made. Say, it's getting made. He's like, what? He said, say it's getting made. I said, but it's not getting made. He goes, how much money do you have? I said, four grand. He says, then you're making it for four grand. <laughs> you're making the movie. People don't wanna miss the boat. If they think the movie's getting made, they're gonna read it. If they think they ne you need them to get it made, they think it must suck. And that's what we do. We send out, we're making this movie, you want in? And all of a sudden we got the little incremental guys and then all of a sudden it was a, literally, we got a hundred grand from somebody. Yeah, you got those guys? Yeah, we'll do that. And then yeah, a million and then Jim Carrey and then boom. But we just said, we're making the movie. And we would have, by the way. Ultimately, I would have made that movie for five grand if I had to, I just would have made it gone off and done it. And um, that, that's the best advice I'd give you on, those, on that. Super easy to follow that up, but would love to hear, like I said, best and worst advice that you guys have gotten. Uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I don't really remember where I got it. I, I think you just pick it up along the way, but I, I definitely agree with the, the bottle rocket thing of, you know, you got to look around and see where you can contribute. Don't, a lot of people, uh, it's the John F. Kennedy thing, you know, they're like, how can I get Steven Spielberg to see, you know, how much I can help him? And you're not going to do that because Steven Spielberg doesn't need your help. And if he does, he'll come and find you and tell you that, you know. So it's really you have to go out there and, and see who, who are the people around me at my level that I'm standing right next to who I think are talented what are they trying to do? How can I help that happen? Whether it's I'll hold a boom, I'll get craft service, like whatever. And you just try to make yourself indispensable to as many pe talented people as you can. And eventually one of them is going to is gonna ask you to be a part of something they're doing because they, they know how much help you can be. 
Um, That's the Bill Paxton way, by the way. That's what he did. You know, he worked on crews. He did everything and just you know, kind of willed himself into it. But keep going. Yeah. And the second thing I think is never, uh, don't ever get complacent about getting better. Um, it's like, you know, you're, it's, it's easy to go, okay, well, I know how to act now and I'm successful. So I, I, I know how to do it and I, I don't have to study anymore. I don't have to try new things. Um, you know, there's always there's always something you can do to get better, and and I think you need to you to always be taking advantage of that. That if if only to just keep yourself kind of alive and excited about it. It's easy to get, you know, like okay, well I'm waiting for the phone to ring, and I don't know, you know. So it's I, you got to keep yourself moving forward. That's it. Based it. Um, I, I don't know if mine will be quite as long and lovely and detailed as the last two, <laughs> I hope but um, I think especially for younger actors, and, and it's just nice to really be true to yourself and do what's right for you, especially for some young women and certain things you're sort of asked to do and have agents that will fight for you and make things work. And I mean, it sounds really simple, but it, it's really important to, to have people fighting for you that you that care about you honestly. and. Yeah, it's good to have a good support system. Um, I think for writers and actors, the biggest thing is attitude. And I think you see so many people who you're looking around and you go like, oh, why not me? And you can take that and shift that and be like, why not me? I could do that. And I think that's a big thing. I think it's you see everyone's getting things going on and, and you want to be that person. And you can be that person. It's just you got to keep doing it. Like a, a, 10 years ago, I was a zombie in an asylum movie. Asylum movie? You know, I was chewing on rope guts in an in a old abandoned prison. And here we are today at this. I mean, it's like you stick with it. Don't quit. And it's like it's going to work out. Don't worry. It's all good. Um, I like what Ron said, which was use your resources. Because for me... One of the biggest pieces of advice I got was a director on a TV show I was working on said, why are you going back to your trailer every time your scene's over? Why don't you just stay on set and learn everything you can? And I was like, what? Oh, I can do that? And if, as long as the director or the producer, or someone's open to asking them questions, you should do that. So I got to operate a million dollar crane that day <laughs> for like two seconds. But I mean, that was really cool. Um, but also when I was on Ladder Milk, I mean, I got really enamored with writing and I got to pester Bobby a lot about his process and how he does it. And I ended up writing a short film and he ended up reading it and I ended up getting a grant for that short film. So grants are also a really cool way. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I think bugging, bugging the people around you. I also bugged Ron a lot one day. And I was like, I'm, I did, yeah. I asked you about all the movies you did and about drinking buddies and how you I just like talking about myself. <laughs> he does like talking. So, you know, it's helpful. That's a, just an ordinary day for me. A, <laughs> he doesn't even airport. remember. I'm in the airport, you know. Boy, I wanna. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, so use, use your resources and, yeah, the people that like you, go up to them and ask them questions. Uh, I, I sort of feel like, uh, you know, the further I'm fortunate enough to be in this business, the more I'm connected to what I started off being connected to, which is just a, literally just the love for what I am uh, allowed to do and what I really love to do. And, and, you know, cracking a scene, seeing what's funny about it, the best way to do it, you know, take after take to really, you know, figure out these incredible words, regardless of what you're, what you're working on. And, and, um, I feel like that's that to me is is has become sort of the most important thing because this business is is a is such a grind. If you lose sight of what it is you actually love, whether it's whatever facet of the business you're in, I, I think that's a, that can be a problem. And and like I said, I feel like the you know I don't know. I hope it's the same way for for most of you out there. The the, the further you go, the more you're connected to what it is you actually really loved about it to begin. With. I just want to add one thing, which is. Um have people around you that are doing the same thing. So like other actors, obviously, because one day I was feeling really down, ended up messaging Will and he, what happened? he sent me the most beautiful text message Aww. about, I you know, about like just keeping going and you know, that we all feel that way sometimes. And that was really cool. So I, thank I have you to, for that. You're very welcome, but I have to admit something. I was feeling really down earlier that day and I, I texted Ron and Ron <laughs> <laughs> sent me some really, the encouraging words and I just copied and pasted them to you so 
sorry, but thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. You, Ron. And the, <laughs> it's funny you should say that. <laughs> it's not just a cast, it's a family. Um, Lawrence, you, you both mentioned putting auditions on tape. Uh, I'd love to kind of hear a little bit about, because that's something you do and it's an isolation and then you send it off and like you said, you think you're never going to hear. Um, did did sending this tape in feel any different than it did the 9,000 others that I'm sure you've sent? You've sent? Um, other than it was really well written. Uh, no, because it, it's you just feel like it's literally going into the abyss a lot of the times, but it is very helpful and has been, it's helped me a lot. It, it's been great. Yeah, I, I kind of prefer self-taping because you get to do it like a lot of times <laughs> and then you can pick your favorite take and if you have a coach you can work with them and um, but you never know if you're going the right direction you can kind of only guess and I don't know when I tape for this I I didn't feel much different except for the fact that I'm blonde blue-eyed and usually I go out for parts where I'm like the sweet girl you know and so I was like oh man I don't know if I'm gonna get this and then I had this mind switch where I thought no I have to really believe it and so then I was able to embody it better and yeah now I'm here so <laughs> and for Ron and Will you both mentioned kind of things have changed and and talk to us a little bit about the changes that you think have been the most beneficial to actors in in recent years in the in the way that the landscape of of Hollywood and making entertainment has changed beneficial I mean if you think there's any <laughs> uh, Ron you could take this on uh, well, there's more stuff, you know. Uh, it used to be you were trying to get a network show, at which point they'd back the Brinks truck up to your house, you know. And But there were only four of those, right? So if you weren't on one of those, you were like, okay, well, maybe I can get a guest spot next week, you know, as the, as the barista. But... <laughs> Now there's a ton of stuff, which means that the uh, the bricks truck got a lot smaller. But uh, I feel like there's a lot there's a lot more uh, risks being taken. Um, people were willing to do stuff because you can you can have a successful business model with a very small slice of audience. So you you can take chances and and be edgy, and you're trying to get people to notice that you're that you're doing something different rather than just trying to do the same thing that they did the last time. Uh, I, it doesn't hurt that it is the best time ever for television in the history of the world. You know, it, it's unbelievable. When I came out here in the 80s, there was one good show per decade. Cheers, Seinfeld, you know, Friends, that's it. You know, there was nothing else you'd work on. I, you'd want to work on. People did because you had to have a job. But now, I mean, it's, it's, un, it's an embarrassment of riches. There's something you can't keep up. You know, that's what's hurting movies. And that's why it's so appealing to, to, to have somebody like the Audience Network say, yeah, okay, they saw the pilot, go. Go do 10 episodes. You're like, you're kidding me. Just, uh, on our own, just go. Like, <laughs> phenomenal. And uh, uh, so there is an advantage there. And that's why a lot of people, uh, a lot of people have careers right now because of this, this new world out there. Guys like, you know, who would have just never been seen again. Uh, like, uh, what's his name from Breaking Bad, you know, the, our lead, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Cranston. yeah, Brian Cranston, his career would have been like, well, he's the guy from M Malcolm in the Middle, that's that. But he was able to totally reinvent himself because there's a new landscape. So there's a lot of good things now. I feel like the, the um, you know, it's been set up here on the panel that, the you know, sort of the being around people that are doing stuff and, and the whole bottle rocket uh, approach to things is, is now... Uh, is now more than ever uh, uh, has become it's become very ad advantageous because of the technological advances because you can literally shoot a movie on your cell phone to where to where if there are people out there uh, with great ideas or people that are talented that you want to work with or you're talented and you want to work with other talented people you can actually produce a product that's on par with you know with the stuff that's out there on 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 broadcast and on network uh, or on cable and and all these over the top networks and streaming and all this stuff and i think that 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 is really uh you know the, aside from the fact that yeah pete's absolutely right there's just a crazy amount of good tv now crazy amount of it that if you were going out and making your own stuff or getting involved with other people's stuff you can really just vet them and see oh do you know what you're doing is this a great script are there great people involved creatively and and uh uh, technically, y y the, the end product has a shot. 
Yeah, well, that's again, that's what Always Sunny did. You know, Always Sunny in Philadelphia was just a bunch of friends got together, did some podcasts or whatever, not podcasts, what do you call them? Web, web, web series. series. And someone's like, hey, those are pretty good. Let's do that. And they just, you know, they, they made it happen themselves. They just willed it to happen. Broad City, too, did that. Yeah. Um, for Peter and Bobby, talk to us about taking this from the page to seeing it actually made with these living, breathing people saying these words that you guys were responsible for. What Were there certain elements or, or moments or scenes that you were like, that turned out 10 times better than I expected? And what, what do you think happened in those instances? I think that, because like Peter said, we had all the episodes written ahead of time, so we had everyone cast afterwards. So we, the, like, this is sort of like the last layer of writing and collaboration with these great actors, because they brought everything, even the stuff I was like, that's going to be pretty good, 10 times better, because they were able to, like, they had imbued it with, you know, spirit and their skills and talent. And so it was pretty incredible to see especially in the pilot, because we had lived with that for a while, seeing those things come to life, and like, that's actually so much better than um, you know, we had initially thought. And it was really cool to, you know, even just like, we're in Loudermilk's apartment. Like, that's just the weirdest thing in the world to be like, we're in a set, it's an apartment, and he's there saying those words, and she's there answering, what's going on? You know, <laughs> we're in Vancouver! And, uh, and so it was like that, and also, um, yeah, it was just really uh, amazing. And also, as Pete, we haven't talked about this, we got to shoot a, a fair chunk of this in a, um abandoned insane asylum, which was pretty awesome. There we go. <laughs> I think that helped. It was also really enjoyable to watch, like, because we did shoot it and block sh shot it, uh, the group, the group in the show, they're, you know, we're there about five minutes of every episode. We didn't want this to turn to Dear John, where you're sitting around yapping for an hour. A half hour so we we're there for five minutes but that group we shot that all out in a week a week and a half and we had crazy good actors in it. we have Matt Frazier I don't know if you know him from American Horror Story and Brian Regan who's maybe the best stand-up comedian working today who had never acted before he'd done like a very small part actually in one one thing and to see these guys developing just over the week where they started getting their sea legs and really getting better and better uh, I found that they, they, it always gets better when you have good actors, but to see those guys, that group, that really, I found that very satisfying. You guys had nothing to do with that, by the way. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that about Brian. Yeah, yeah I, I had no idea. I didn't know that he hadn't done a lot of acting before. It, he didn't seem like a guy that hadn't done a lot of acting before. Yeah, he was only in, uh, I think he was in a, a Chris Rock movie. But he's doing, right now, he's doing three nights in a row at Carnegie Hall, sold out like six months in advance. He's He's, he's crazy good stand-up. Uh, kind of the opposite question for the actors. Uh, Anya, you mentioned that it, this wasn't a role that you normally would go out for. Was that a scary for you? And what, what, what elements of your characters were you like, God, I don't know how I'm going to get into that, how I'm going to unlock that piece of that character? And what got you to that point that obviously they loved everything you guys did? Um, for me... I think the difficulty was I was thinking about, oh, I don't look right for it. And that's kind of what held me back because I did feel like I could connect to her. It wasn't, that wasn't the problem for me. So when I let go of thinking about, oh, what I look like, then it helped. But also for the callback, I was on set the night before and my hair was really messy. And I thought, I'm not going to wash it. It looks really bad and <laughs> in the description of Claire it says she is always drunk and so I was like well okay if she's always drunk she's gonna look like this right now and so I put red lipstick on and I smeared it and I had terrible makeup and I walked into the casting office and everyone else was kind of pristine and I thought oh no either I've really messed this <laughs> up or this is gonna go well so I was like well this is what I'm at now so <laughs> But I, I mean, I had to do something because being, going for the roles that I usually go for, it's easier for me to get them because I know what to do and how to look for it. But for this, I wasn't sure. So letting myself be ugly, you know, or just letting go of my image really helped me connect with Claire and get the part. So that was really cool. So I'm, I'm getting a theme of just not showering is what was the key to <laughs> It's all it takes. Don't shower. <laughs> How about for you, Ron? Was what, what was what was the the key to unlocking him, and and what was the more difficult parts? Uh, I mean, I was I was a little bit I was definitely a little scared going in it that I just didn't know if it was going to work, you know. 
um, because this guy is so, uh, you know, stridently aggravating, uh, which is what I loved about it. But at the at the same time, you go, I don't know, is the audience just gonna ha have had enough of this guy after ten minutes? And I don't know where it's gonna land. But I, you know, there have been times in my career where I picked jobs based on how I thought they uh, they they fit my strengths, um, and they're not. They're not always my favorite jobs. They're not always my either to work on or, or to see. Nowadays, I, I've gotten to the point where it's kind of a cliche, but uh, if there's not something about the part that scares the hell out of you, it's not really worth doing because that's actually the thing. The thing that scares the hell out of you is the thing that's going to make it interesting, and that's the part that you have to like dive into. So that I, you know, it it did scare the hell out of me, but in a, in a really good way. Yeah, I'm always afraid going into a movie. Like you have, you have to have that. If you're not, then something's wrong. It's too easy. It doesn't feel right. You know, Cam Neely. If anybody's a hockey fan, uh, you know, Boston Bruins, Seabass. Yeah, he uh, he told me that he's a Hall of Famer. He played for like 12 years. He would have played more, but he busted his leg up. But anyway, he said he threw up for every game he ever had. I was like, Are you shitting? How can you? What? They have 82 games a year. He said I threw up for every game. I was like, You never got used to it? Nope. For every game just butterflies, I had to go into the bathroom, throw up before I went out, out there. And, and, and you know, he, he was a Hall of Famer, he cared. He really wanted something special to happen, and that's, you get butterflies when you're starting a project. So it's just, I think that's normal and good. Yeah. Did you have butterflies, Laura? Well, I mean, look at the cast and the wonderful director and everybody, what they've done. I mean, you just go, oh, wow, I'm getting to work with them. Um, but that's that's part of the amazing part of it all. It's exciting. And But being the new kid at school for your first day, it's like, how is this going to grow? But no, it's been great. I mean, it was fun. It was totally fun. Yeah, I'm always scared on day one, but I, I'm, I'm no longer scared about being scared on day one. It's just like, okay, I'm scared. Here we go. Day two will be better. I mean, that's the key. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to thank all of you guys for coming out and seeing this. Please make sure to tune in and watch it all over again, actually on Audience Network, and watch the whole rest of the season. I want to thank all of you guys for being here today uh, and taking the time out of your day. I know that uh, it's been informative for me, hopefully informative for all of you guys. Make sure to check out all the other panels that they have going on all year round. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Really appreciate it. Nice job.